Hey everyone, this is Lindsay Baroker, science fiction and fantasy author, and I'm here answering your questions again this week. This is my second time. I have my mic set up, so hopefully the sound quality will be good, as long as no dogs wander through and start barking. I am wearing my dragon hat since, since I don't need the headset now. So you can see it's got the scale, uh, what do you call those, scales, ridges, something like that. Uh, my youngest dog loves it. She thinks it's a dog toy, so she follows me through the house and, and jumps and tries to get to the back thing. Um, so if you ever see me walking around with paw prints on my back, you'll know what happened. But I am going to get right to the questions now because last time I ended up talking 30 minutes when I meant to talk 10. So uh, the first one is from Monica. And these are all from my Facebook author group. You can find me over there at Lindsay Baroker, facebook.com slash Lindsay Baroker. And she asked, since Star Kingdom has concluded and Death Before Dragons is soon to be finished too, can you tell us about your plans for forthcoming books? Are you going to revisit any of your previous series or are you planning something altogether new and different? Also, are you going to write any more books as Ruby Lion's Drake? And for those that don't know, Ruby Lion's Drake, which is an anagram, anagram, this is why authors write because we can't speak of my name that a fan came up with. And I write, I haven't written any in a couple of years, but I was writing science fiction romance, a little steamier than my usual stuff. Uh, the pen name is something I started when somebody complained because in Balanced on the Blade's Edge, the first book in my uh, Dragon Blood series, I had a sex scene, which I had not really had quite as detailed in, a, in other books. So there were people that didn't want that, people that liked them to be a little cleaner. So I made the pen name for the naughty stuff. And there's about 15 novels under that name if you want to check them out, if you like the naughty stuff, or uh, if you just want some more stories by me. Uh, other than the fact that they're more graphic, they're very typical, uh, same kind of quirky characters and uh, humor that I put in my other books. Um, so right now I'm not planning to do any more. I just found it a lot of work to maintain and do all the marketing and trying to like keep people, you know, keep the books selling across two names. Um, I may get inspired someday to do a trilogy or something on, under that name. You never know when you need a break and want to do something different. But for the last couple of years, I've just been focusing on my name and I found that that just simplifies things and keeps it easier. Uh, but the first question was, what's next? I am working on the ninth book in my Death Before Dragon series right now, and that's going to wrap up everything. At least, you know, I may do more in the future, but that will wrap up kind of all the main story stuff. And so next I'm planning for 2021 is a, a new epic fantasy series. It's something I, I've written a lot of kind of high fantasy slash steampunk. And I tend to, they tend to be epic in scope by the end of the series. The, you know, I start with one or two point of view characters and then you get more characters coming in. And by the end, I've got like six, seven, eight point of view characters. And I thought, why don't I just start with book one with, um, it might not have that many, but like four or six point of view characters and just kind of a, a bigger story from the beginning. And that, there's another perk on that too, if you sell audiobooks and, and Audible is kind of the big player in audiobooks. Um, people get subscribed to the credits for $15 a month. You know, they can get their one audiobook a month. And because they paid $15, they want to get like the longest book they can find often, especially in sci-fi and fantasy, because that's the biggest bang for their buck, right? Uh, if they get something that costs $30 for $15, they feel like it's a really good deal. So I was thinking since my books tend to get longer anyway, like with my Star Kingdom series, the last couple were over 15 hours of audio, over 150,000 words. Like, why don't I just start out with something like that? And then maybe it'll be a little more appealing on the audiobook side. So uh, epic fantasy this year, but I am definitely thinking of revisiting some of my previous series worlds. I have a lot of ideas, quite frankly. Um, it's a little easier to sell, you know, make money, I guess. I am a full-time author, <laughs> for those that don't know. So I have to always kind of weigh like the artsy side with what actually has commercial potential too. And it's a little harder to go back to like a four or five year old series and do a new book in it because you're basically only selling to the existing fans of that series. Whereas if you start a brand new series, hopefully your, your regular readers will check it out. And also you can attract new people that are like, oh, book one, this is just starting. I'm going to get into this. So that's kind of why I hesitate sometimes to commit to doing like a whole bunch more in, story, in series I've already finished. But I, I do enjoy the characters I've already written. I'm definitely thinking of doing more Dragon Blood might pop, pop back into the Star Kingdom universe. I have a couple of series, Rust and Relics is probably the next one. Earlier in my career, I wasn't as good about committing to finishing a series. So I have two still that I have to go back to and write a couple more books in and planning to do that soon too. So, so I think with the epic fantasy, they're going to be such long books. 
uh, with a lot of the point of view characters, they they're just require a lot more mental headspace. I have a dog wandering in, so hopefully you don't hear too much clacking in the background, toenails on the hardwood floors, you know. But they require a little more, it's just a lot more effort. I hats off to, hats off, <laughs> hats on to like Brandon Sanderson and those guys that write like 300,000 word stories. That would take so much longer and be like so many require so many more read throughs just to make sure you get the chron chronolog everything in chronological order and making sense and the storylines all coming together. Um, so that is basically the answer to that question. Epic fantasy coming next year. No Ruby Lion Strike on the horizon right now, but maybe someday. And definitely planning to do maybe some standalones or you know finishing up the older series. All right, the next question is from Katrian. I would also like to know where your affinity for worlds and really lots of stories in the same universe per series comes from. I like that too, but I feel if it's not a really popular thing, maybe three books or so and boom, done. That was kind of interesting to me because I actually, maybe it's just the kind of things I'm drawn to as a reader. I tend to go towards a uh, series that have a lot of books because I really love, once I like your character, like if you're an author, if I like your characters, I'm going to keep reading. You know, I, I grew up watching uh, Star Trek, I think I mentioned in the last video, and you know, I couldn't get enough of those characters, even like the episodes that were painful, like original series, you know, the sets and stuff were pretty awful back then. But um, even the stories that weren't that great, it's like there'd just be that a couple minutes of the characters having some cute interaction together, and you know, you love that relationship, and so I'd want to just read them or, or watch those over and over again for those moments. And so that's the kind of reader and um, TV viewer I've always been. I love like a, a series of 10 books. So it never even occurred to me, like I have done some one, one off stories and one or two stories where I just had the idea and I wanted to explore it. But most of the time, like my first series, The Emperor's Edge was always from the beginning. I, I knew it would be six novels. It actually ended up being seven because the last one was 230,000 words, something like that. So I, I split it in half, Forged in Blood one and two. And then I wrote another book after that that was also 200 some thousand words. So I can do the epic guys. Um, but that's just what I really like. Uh, and also from the author marketing perspective, readers tend to be, a lot of readers are the same way. Some people get sick of characters, but uh, there's a lot of people that love just, you know, they'll read 17, 18 books with the same character. I am um, Jim Butcher, Dresden Files. I think he's up there in that 17 or 18 by now. And a lot of people just love them and, and want to read more. So. But yeah, you can actually afford to spend a little bit more marketing the first book if you have like eight, 10 more novels at full price, maybe like maybe you drop the price on the first one to get people to try the series. And then if they like it, they go on and they don't mind paying five, you know, $5. As an indie author, I usually, my books are $4.99. Uh, traditional publishing, they'll often be like $9.99, but that's a, a topic for another video. But so it makes sense from the marketing perspective. And, and like I said, that's just kind of what I gravitate towards anyway. Once I and with the characters, it's really hard. You know, I have new ideas. I want to do new stuff, of course, but I just really enjoy spending time with those characters. All right, the next question is from Joe, uh, female Joe. This is going to be, it's kind of longish. I might break this up here. So my question would be how you come up with the names for your characters. Do you just know from the start or do you develop the character first and then name them? I noticed some German words here and there, so that got me thinking maybe there was a specific process to this. I'll pause there and answer that part of the question. So it kind of depends. My first novel, I was or my first series, I was very into like all these character names have to mean something, almost all of them. So like the the heroine Amaranth, gosh, I don't even remember what it meant now. I knew 10 years ago when I wrote it, but it was something like everlasting or, you know, it's the, it's a grain. It, it came from the Greek roots. Uh, but yeah, it, it had a name. And then the assassin was very on the nose, Sicarius, which I probably, my, I have no Latin background, but it was Latin for assassin. But, uh, you know, I liked the sound of it, too, so I picked that one. A lot of times I just uh, bang the keys, you know. Uh, my second big series, uh, Dragon Blood, the main, the hero is named, one of the heroes is named Ridgewalker Zerkander. And I made up the Zerkander part, but Ridgewalker, I actually overheard a conversation when I was skiing. Uh, a guy in the chair going up, you know, was saying, yeah, he named his son Ridgewalker because they were in the mountain climbing and that stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that poor kid, what horrible name to have to explain to everybody growing up. And then I thought, I need to do that to a character and give him that name too. So that was one. And as far as the German words, I actually took German in high school. So maybe some, there's some of that in the background, although I accidentally named the, the female character in that series Sardell. 
I'm not sure that's what the German pronunciation would be, not that, but, uh, and then I published it. I never thought, you know, and now these days I've learned to Google something and check like, does this mean something in a different language? Because I just thought I made it up. And a reader said, hey, did you mean to name your main character Anchovy? I was like, what? <laughs> so I Googled it. I was like, I had, lo and behold is the German word for like anchovy or sardine or something like that. So whoops. And, and what's funny is I actually have sold the rights to that series to a German publisher and they're doing the translations right now. And I, I forgot to ask, I'd be really curious if they, I hope they give her a different name, <laughs> like go right ahead, you know, maybe change the S to a Z and make it Zardel. I don't know. Um, so going on with this question, is it difficult to write about similar yet separate worlds, especially keeping apart the more subtle differences between the worlds that have dragons or the sci-fi settings? Uh, I have no problem keeping the sci-fi and the fantasy apart in my head. That's pretty easy just because the vastly different technology levels. I don't, um, what, things that can be difficult with this is kind of silly with the sci-fi. There's always weapons, right? In sci-fi, start, you know, I do space opera kind of adventures and you can't use uh, blasters as are taken by Star Wars, right? And phasers were Star Trek, so you're like, oh, what? I think I had blazers <laughs> in one series and this last one, I don't know, they were direct energy weapons. I just looked that up, oh, that sounds good. We'll call them D-Tech weapons. And I, for the sci-fi romance, I, their name's something else. So it's like, you run out of names for weapons. <laughs> it's like my problem. But um, as far as the, you know, sometimes I'll make up religions and monetary systems and money, you know, making that stuff up can be a little, uh, you want to try to make sure you're not repeating yourself or doing the same concepts over and over again which is especially a challenge for me because I have a horrible long-term memory. I'm so envious of those people that are on Jeopardy. I'm like, how do you remember all that stuff that you learned when you were like eight? I can't even remember. Like, people ask me details about books I wrote two years ago. I'm like, gosh, I don't remember even that character. Are you sure that was from one of my books? So I've learned to keep pretty extensive story Bibles where I just kind of write down everything as I make it up so I can reference it later. And I think I'm going to do a video coming up on uh, using my writing software Scrivener and how I kind of use it to keep all the characters straight and do the story Bible and just try to not to screw things up too much uh, going through like a nine book series. I, I do have beta readers and I'm thankful they have better memories than I do because they often catch stuff like, hey, uh, you already had your group of heroes attacked by a tentacle creature in this story. So I think you should do something else in this story. I was like, oh, okay, great. It'll be a plant creature in this story, but so yes, it is a little bit. It is, I'm not sure if it's just how much time passes or if after you've written a lot of series and a lot of novels, it, it is a challenge not to repeat yourself because you, you tend to have certain things you really love, like some tropes or concepts, and you want to use them a lot because they're exciting for you to write about. They're your favorite things. Like I love assassins in fantasy, right? Um, so it can be hard to kind of find the line between not being repetitive and boring, but also doing the things that excite you and that kind of probably drew your readers in the first place. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience as a reader, you have like an author like, oh my gosh, I love this series. I love these characters. And then you go pick up something else by the author and they, it's really different to the point where you're like, eh, that was kind of a disappointing series. So it's, it's always a challenge. Um, and last question from Joe. Joe. Joe had a wall of text for me. I appreciate it, Joe. Give me a lot to work with. I would be curious to hear you talk about other fi fantasy and sci-fi authors you like to get inspiration for, um, for the fast approaching day when I've read every last one of your books. All right. You know, people always ask for recommend recommendations. And I think my favorite sci-fi author is Lois McMaster Bujold. And I think uh, if you've read the Vorkosigan series, you can probably see her influence in a lot of my stuff. A, a lot of people, especially in my Star Kingdom series, have said Casimir really reminds them of Miles, which is actually funny because I, I copied somebody for that character. He was super inspired by somebody, but he's actually a real person. Um, so I, I've almost, uh, nobody I know in person, you know, I've always, almost been tempted to email that person and be like, hey, you know, I designed a character kind of after you. What do you think? Do you want to read it? But I'd be like, I don't know, too embarrassed to reach out. But sometimes when, you meet somebody that, or you just know, see somebody or on TV or something like an actor that's really quirky and interesting. And you kind of take that model them, take them as a model, you know, to keep it stuck in your mind and give you some mannerisms. And then you bring in your own like your character's background. Um, I gave Casimir has seizures and a lot of medical issues. That's probably a, a lot of the link too between him and Miles. He's also 
kind of a pacifist hero who I don't think he shoots anybody in, in the whole series. He's more of a roboticist hacker type. And so he's always using his mind to come up with problems. And, and in sci-fi, that really works, right? If you can hack into the, the bad guy's security system, you can get your team in. Um, what was the question? Okay, some of my inspirations. So Bujol, for sure. And then I grew up reading just tons. I was really a more voracious reader when I was younger. Uh, now, a lot of the time I used to spend reading, I now spend writing. Um, so now I often just do audiobooks while I'm walking the dogs. But um, David Eddings, I really liked. I lo loved his humor. Um, Raymond Feist wrote all those books. I'd read so many Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance books. And I wouldn't say those are necessarily like, you should go read those because they were awesome. But they were awesome to me because I just really enjoyed that when I first found fantasy. I read most of those as a teenager. Um, some more recent stuff. Um, for Actually, for sci-fi romance, these aren't so recent. But in the last 10 years, I think I read them. Linnea Sinclair, I, I really enjoy hers, and I'm sad that she stopped writing. I, I hope she starts self-publishing, because I would kind of guess that my, my feel with that particular niche is that it doesn't sell well enough for the traditional publishing to be that interested in it. And that would be kind of my guess, is like they just said, yeah, we don't need any more of these. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed hers. Um, recently, oh, Rachel Aaron has um, some series you could check out if you like the humor in your fantasy. Also, she wrote a trilogy as Rachel Bach. Oh, I just am blank, uh, blanking on the name of it. I will try to remember to put it in the uh, down below. It, you can check the links. Um, recently, we read Marissa Meyer. She's got like a four book fairy tale sci fi series. They're more YA. And I don't know, I just kind of read those really quickly on, on a trip. So those were fun. And I'm sure I'm forgetting tons of awesome authors. If there's somebody you like, please leave a comment below and recommend it so that um, anybody who finds this video later on can get ideas for cool stuff to read. All right, a shorter question next from Angela. What does the average writing day look like for you? Routines that keep you motivated. Yeah, um, I've been full time for like eight years as an author and almost 20 years, <laughs> that's how old I am guys. Uh, since I got out of the army and finished school, I've been working one way or another from home. And um, I just kind of keep a pretty normal routine. I get up, you know, have some coffee or read or screw around on my phone <laughs> as one does. I'm not doing the miracle morning, guys. I'm not that hardcore. Um, and then I walk the dogs, feed them, feed myself. And then it's usually about nine and I start writing or, you know, if it's an admin day, I'm doing email or getting ready to release a book. Uh, work till, for lunch, I usually just have a snack, uh, like some granola, protein bar, that kind of thing, so that I don't have to take a long break. And then work in the afternoon to, you know, kind of four or five. It sort of depends on the time of year because I walk the dogs again in the evening. So in the winter, I got to break a little earlier because it gets dark so soon. Um, so walk them again. And then I also do some kind of workout. Uh, since COVID has started, I kind of have been gradually assembling my home gym. So I don't actually have to leave the house anymore to do that stuff. Dinner and then... Um, it kind of depends uh, what my goals are. Like if I have a deadline with the editor coming up, I'll probably work a couple more hours in the evening. Or if I finished everything, I actually take the evenings off, which can be a novel idea. Um, I'm not super good about taking weekends. Instead, I tend to work almost every day while I'm working on a project, like a book. I write pretty quickly, so that's maybe a two to three week uh, time period. Maybe take a day off, like uh, switch, edit it, send it off. And then I'll take, try to take a couple of days or back when I actually traveled a little bit, that'd be, you know, in between projects, I might take a trip or something. So that's sort of how I like to do it. So really pretty, pretty boring. Um, I'm going to talk about motivation coming up, I think, in the next question or two questions from now. So let me go ahead and just move, ahead, move on to that. Next one is from Eleanor. I would be interested, interested to hear the obvious things like why you write, how you have the energy to write so much and keep motivated how you come up with your stories and the inspiration for your wonderful characters. Thank you for calling them Eleanor. <laughs> wonderful Eleanor. I'd love to know which of your characters is most like you as well. So why I write in the beginning, you know, when it was still a hobby, it was just because I love stories. I read so much as a kid. I mentioned before that I was an only child. So, um, you know, once you, once it got dark and you can't play with your friends anymore, you go inside and read books or, you know, car trips. I read a lot of them when we were going to swim meets. So just always love stories. I was very bad at actually finishing things. I tended to write till I got to the hard part. You know, like the beginning would be fun. You'd have all these ideas. And then you're like, hmm, I'm not sure what happens next. And kind of abandon it for a while. And the next time I'd come back, I'd write something else. I got more serious about it in my 20s uh, and joined a workshop. And that kind of helped me go, keep going because other people were critiquing it and expecting new chapters. And I was seeing them having success. So that made me want to keep doing more. Um, 
But as far as how I, the energy to write so much now and keep motivated, it's actually really easy to be honest. Once it becomes, once you make the transition to this is your full-time job and you're not trying to balance having another full-time job with all, whatever responsibilities you might have as a parent or just other things you have going on in your life and then trying to find time to write like 15, 20 minutes here and there, that's when it's really hard. And that's when people have a hard time staying motivated because at that point you just, maybe you're hoping someday you can sell your book and make some money, you know, but you're kind of almost doing it for the love of it or for future dreams at that point. So it's, it's really easy to get derailed. My first goal when I was uh, full-time at my other work was to write a thousand words a day. And if I was really rolling, I could do that in like a half hour. Sometimes it took longer. I found that the best way to make sure I could do that was to have everything kind of be thinking about it ahead of time. So that when I finally sat down to work on it, and usually I used to be a night owl, used to be late at night, you know, I would already know what the scene was going to happen in the scene. So it's pretty easy to just to sit down and write it. So, um, but yeah, once you're full time, it's sort of like, well, you just, you got to keep writing. I mean, I enjoy it anyway. I would keep writing even if I wasn't uh, getting paid at this point. Um, but I probably wouldn't write as much because there is definitely some motivation to be like, oh, release a new book, make good money. Um, so yeah, once you're full time, it's just like anything else, right? You can't just be like, well, I'm just not going to do my job today. I mean, maybe you can do that once, right? But if you do that for a week, your boss is probably going to fire you. Uh, so if you want to continue to uh, pay the bills with your writing, uh, that that's a little bit of motivation. Hopefully not too negative of motivation. Hopefully you really still enjoy what you're doing. Uh, so how do you how do you come up with characters for your stories or for the inspiration? I, I mentioned in the previous question that you know sometimes they're just I pick them. Sometimes I kind of pick the profession first. Like in the epic fantasy, I, I'm kind of planning right now. I know I need an archaeologist character because there's going to be this uh, archaeological dig starting things off and, and kind of at the basis uh, of a lot of the storyline, especially for the first book. So that may be a starting point uh and then like i said if i if there's just some actor or person you kind of know I, like i try not to use anybody no really you're not supposed to design characters after your family or ex-boyfriends and things like that guys but you know somebody you kind of have encountered and it's like wow that person i don't really know them well, that well but they're really quirky and they had those interesting mannerisms so i might just use that for a character so that can be uh in, you know inspiration and it also can help you keep that character firmly in your mind um, so, and you asked also, I'd love to know which of your characters are most like you as well. I'm going to say McCall from Fractured Stars, which I think only three people have read. Now. <laughs> no, that's not true. I know from the reviews and the sales, it was more than three people, but um, that was just a one-off story. So it wasn't very, it wasn't part of a series or anything. I marketed really hard. Um, but yeah, I, any characters you feel like might be on the autism <laughs> spectrum are probably really easy for me to write for some reason. So there have been quite a few like that. I would love to say I'm like Kim Sato from my Star Kingdom series, but she's super smart and I'm not. <laughs> and um, she's also can kick some butt in some martial arts. And I also, uh, I took some Taekwondo as a kid, but there, there's very little butt kicking that goes on in my life. All right, that was the last of the questions I'm doing this week. Last question is for you guys. Um, since I kind of teased it earlier, what is your favorite book or some of your favorite books that you would like to recommend um, that other people try out. So you guys don't have to put my books, that's, <laughs> put some other authors down there. And um, that way, anybody that comes along later, check out the comments below and maybe you can get some ideas for new authors. I always figured that anybody that likes my books probably likes books with you know quirkiness and humor. But I've certainly seen, whenever I ask for recommendations, it's always amazing. Like I get some really literary stuff too. And I'm like, wow, you like that kind of book and you also read my books, which are not literary. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for watching the video. If you could give me a thumbs up, that would be awesome. If you want to uh, subscribe, uh, you'll find out whenever I put a new video up. I think the next thing I'm going to do is actually going to be, I'll do a screen share, like I was talking about, of my writing software. And just uh, give you a little bit of what my what goes on in my mind when I'm working at planning a series. And just sort of what my, everything, I guess behind the scenes we'll call it, what everything looks like uh, for, you know, <laughs> if, if it's organized or not. I'll show you guys. That is it for me. Thanks. Bye-bye, guys.